subscribers to New Orleans Football get all of our news and analysis. We got a story up there right now breaking down the Saints draft prototypes. Last year, we nailed three of the first three picks doing that. So we ran the same process. Chances are, whoever the Saints are drafting, we found them in that article. Make sure you go check it out. Use the code NOF to save 20% on your first payment. That's neworleans.football forward slash subscribe. Use the code NOF to save 20% on your first payment. All right, welcome back to another episode of New Orleans Football, presented by PJ's Coffee. We're at our new studio right next door to Map Hours on Veteran Memorial Boulevard. If you need a new car, make sure you go check him out. He has 12 dealerships all over the region. Any type of car you want, he will take care of you, get you the best price, the best customer care, the best car buying experience. That's my guy. Make sure you go check him out. All right, we got a great show for you guys today. We're going to talk about the best case scenarios in the draft. If one thing could happen, what would we want it to be? We're going to talk about that and so much more. But we'll be right back after this quick word from our great sponsors. The New Orleans Dot Football Show is proudly presented by PJ's Coffee. PJ's Coffee has some of the best drinks that you can find. They have locations all over the city. They have pastries and everything else you need to get your day started. So go check them out. Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring? Look no further than Friend and Company Fine Jewelers' new engagement salon. This new area houses a wide selection of engagement rings to choose from in all cuts, sizes, and colors. Their experienced staff offer five-star customer care to help you find the perfect ring to express your love. Visit their new engagement salon today. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the perfect ring for the perfect moment and also for the perfect person. 7713 Maple Street between Adams and Burdett Street. 504-866-5433. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers. Check them out at friendandcompany.com. Hard Hide Punch Tool Strawberry Whiskey is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon, American light whiskey, and fresh Punch Tool strawberries. Blended in New Orleans, it is not for the thin skinned. Look for it in your favorite stores, bars, and restaurants. New Orleans Stop Football is proud to be sponsored by Firehouse Subs. Make sure you check out their location on Veterans Boulevard. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome back. Let's get into our lead topic presented by Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the official jewelers of the New Orleans Saints. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers has a great engagement salon. So if you are looking to pop the question, make sure you go by, talk to my guy, Ken. He'll get you a beautiful ring at the price point that you can afford, and you will have no regrets about your experience there. Make sure you check them out today. They're on Maple Street. And while you're there, make sure you check out their Florida lead necklace and earring that you see on the screen right now. The necklace is thirteen fifty, and the earrings are eleven hundred dollars. Make sure you tell them that I know I've sent you. All right, we're about to kick off one of our favorite annual annual exercises here at New Orleans Dot Football with our first mock draft simulation on Thursday morning. You were the original. You were the original. The original. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. take that. The original mock draft simulation. Of, there's a lot of them out there, but this is the real one. Yeah. We we go out there. We play like we're in the war room. We run a simulation. We go back and forth. We try to come to a consensus. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't, but we come to a unified front on what we're going to do with that. That comes out Thursday. Make sure you sign up for the site. Use the code NOF, 20% off your first payment. But let's talk about some of the stuff right now because yeah. some of these scenarios aren't going to play out. We went through our simulation. A lot of these names we're about to talk about, they, they were already gone or weren't available. But if we had to go through one of these, and we're going to go through five of them here. Yeah. If we had to go through them, These are the two good to be true options. I, I consider all five of these options... Like, we can't believe it fell that way, and we really mean it. You know, <laughs> not just, hey, this is exactly what we wanted. These are five truly exactly what we wanted. What I want to know is what consensus we reach on. What is the top choice? Like, if we're sitting there in the draft room saying, this is the absolute best case scenario, and we're going to start with Olu Fashion. He's a Penn State left tackle. This is obviously the Saints' number one need. We all agree on that. We just did a, a show Monday where we said what can make or break the Saints season, and we picked the offensive line as the number one thing. And this guy is just a stud. I mean, there are Teron Armstead comparisons out there. He's a true left tackle. Not everybody is. And a lot of people are mocking him to the Saints right now, but I think those are people who are just trying to find a spot for him. I, I feel like it would be a too good to be true if he actually falls to 14, but that's a run the card to the podium scenario, right? I, I think that the mock drafts are wrong about the order that these guys are going to go. I, I don't I don't agree with with how they have them. When you watch them, it's it's a little confusing. Even yeah. that, that like Huaga is is ahead of Olu. Like I I just I don't buy that. I don't see it. I, like I watched them today. I I thought Olu 
I, I think he's far and away a better prospect. And, and and all of them, he's kind of following. It's like, well, we'll just throw him here after Latham. And like, I like him more than Latham. And that even, didn't ha- start happening until like two weeks ago. He used to go in the top 10 of like every mock I saw until about, I don't know, March 20th. It's nothing he did wrong at the combine or whatever. I, I think a couple more quarterbacks have moved up and they've like, oh, now where do we put Fashionu? But this guy is a bona fide top 10 prospect. I, I don't think anyone is more like check every box than that we're going to talk about that could possibly fall to them. I mean, Joe Alt too, but I think it's even less likely that he falls. Yeah, Joe Alt, he, he's definitely the he's number probably one. Like he's definitely the number one guy. Yeah, no question about it. I, I just, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit confused about how they have some of these guys, right? Like to me, it, it's all Olu, uh, Latham, Fuaga. Like I even like Guyton, I think more than Fuaga. Like yeah. I don't kind of like Guyton too. I, I don't know that Fuaga is like your left, tackle he doesn't I don't I don't see it necessarily and I could definitely be wrong but just watching him it kind of felt like why are we having the conversation in this order and yeah you know I kind of like started asking questions I I don't know that the mock drafters see it the same as the league like I think the league might see it a little bit differently than how some of these mock drafts look and then you know one of the things that happens with these things is that there's a lot of group think that kind of sets yeah. in too and especially among analysts yes because teams do Teams share information with each other, and they share information with analysts. I am not mocking the people that do, the people that do this are incredible. They are. at what they do. The, you know, we're friends with a lot of them. Uh, uh, Field Yates, Dane Brugler, uh, so many other guys that are so good at this. But they they do start to kind of be like, "Am I missing on something?" Daniel Jeremiah, the NFL Network, is one of the best. Like that guy started having that guy in his top ten. If I have him at thirty five, do I want to be out on that limb? That that definitely takes over. It's very similar in like fantasy rankings too. No doubt about it. And look, I think the the greatest draft analyst of all time was probably Mike Mayock, and he went and ran a team. And was trying to, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, there's just there's there's a level of information that kind of comes out. And then look, a lot of the the consensus like it's it's interesting how it, how it forms. Like there's there's these services that kind of work for the entire league that the teams pay toward. And they kind of do like the initial ranking of everyone. And I think that sets the stage a lot of times. And I think people kind of get slotted. And then like, there's probably, look, I, I, there's a handful of teams that kind of see it a different way. And then like, they go a different and it's like, oh, wow, they reached or they missed. And it's just like, no, that's just kind of how it looks. And I, look, I just think personally, when the draft happens, I just have a feeling that these guys are going to come off the board yeah. differently than, than how it looks. Right I now. agree. I'll be. I, I'd be pretty surprised if Fashionu is not the second le- uh, offensive lineman out. Although we are hearing, and and this is one thing the analysts seem to have right. Maybe eight to ten offensive linemen overall in round one. What's interesting is if it's not Alt or Fashionu for the Saints, everyone else could potentially be a right tackle instead of a left tackle, a left guard instead of a left tackle, maybe be a left. Tackle. The good thing for the Saints is they have needs at all three of those positions, so they could draft any one of these yeah. guys and they'll find a home for him. All right, here's my second one. Um, this is another one that I think a lot of people consider a run run the card to the podium guy for the Saints, and that's Brock Powers. Hold up, hold up, back up, back up, yeah. back up. Out of the five, where do you rank this in terms of like getting? Well, we're gonna go through them all. We're gonna. Oh, I'm gonna rack them as we go. Yeah. Well, right now, I think. Fashion is obviously the one to beat. We haven't gotten anyone else yet. I got so. I got it second on the list, though. Like this is too out of all the scenarios. Okay, this is too okay, for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well, Brock Bowers. Does Brock Bowers pass up Olu Fashionu for you? He's the Georgia tight end who I'd say maybe 30% chance he falls to the Saints at 14. He's obviously that big pass catcher. He's filling the tight end need that they have. I think they gotta come away from this draft with the tight end. No one else would help their passing game as much as Brock Bowers, but they just need a body in there and they need a young player in that room. Um, so this is another one that it's kind of a tough call between these two guys. How do you rank them? So, yeah, look, I, it would be tough to pass him up. And if he's there, I think you got to, you kind of got to take him. The problem with this team is, is I don't know that you have the flexibility. And if you have the good tackle versus a tight end and they're both sitting there, I don't know that you can go with the tackle right now because we don't know the rest of their plan, and they need two offensive tackles. So I think the tackle has to be ranked ahead of Bowers, yeah. but I think I think it would be incredibly hard. And I think this is one of those things where you're like, man, would they regret it if they pass up on someone like that? Because how often is it that yeah. there's a tight end that's worthy of a top 15 pick? There's one in Atlanta that hasn't quite worked out the True. way it has. But I can't remember. It's been a while. It's been a while. Like they, These guys don't come around too often. Yeah. Kind of a unicorn. Get a We've lot t- of George Kittle comparisons, yes. like a lot of tight ends do, but but his game in particular, and and sure enough, the offensive coordinator just worked for George Kittle, so yeah, it's hard not to love the fit. The only thing I, the counter argument is, 
uh, or no, sorry, the I'm picking Fashionu. I, I just I love Fashionu. I, I'm picking Fashionu almost regardless of need. I, I think he's an incredible player. I just we talked about this the other day. The offensive line just makes everything else go. These other guys can operate because you get your offensive line in order. I don't want to see their offensive line collapse. The counter argument though is if you don't if you take Brock Bowers in round one. You can take a off- an offensive lineman in round two that can probably start for your team. If you don't take Bowers in round one, there's there's just no equivalent. The drop off is drastic. You're just getting a guy if you don't take Brock. Absolutely, Bowers. yeah, no doubt. I mean that's 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 the thing. It's a unicorn almost. But like you have not these guys do not above exist. Bowers. I think you have to, and I think it's just the way that their team's constructed right now. It's limiting, and I, I don't know that how you many can have- how many tackles do we go before you're willing to let yourself take Bowers? What if what if that, what if Alton Fashion are the only two tacklers who are gone? Or will you take Bowers then? Latham? I don't I don't love any of the other ones. Like I, I think you can wait till the second round yeah. on some of them. So I mean if the so top Bowers two are gone, be, yeah. yeah. I think you can still get one at forty five in, in another year. That guy would probably be the twentieth pick. But there's like you said, eight, yeah. seven, eight, nine, ten of these guys that, that are just the Which the, means the value is, is still insane. gonna be good because yeah. not everyone's gonna, you know. People are going to take other things. All right, well, along the same lines then, I have yet to see a mock where Romo Dunze, the Washington wide receiver, falls all the way to the Saints, but he's flirting with it now. Like I say, every time somebody puts J.J. McCarthy up in their, in their top 10 as a fourth quarterback, or some people are even putting five quarterbacks in their top 13, he is kind of the consensus third receiver. So there is potential like sort of the Marshawn Lattimore draft where there's just a surprise and somebody that everyone had in their top five, six, seven falls. He's a guy who could fall. He's a, he, he could be that possession receiver. He could be that X receiver. Um, he's not quite the Brock Bowers size guy, but, but obviously can fill that need as a pass catcher. Do you like him better than these two guys if he falls? I've said it before, like all things being equal, I, I got to take the, the tight end ahead yeah. of the, the, the wide receiver. So I would take Bowers before him, I think, and I might end up regretting that down the line. Right, Odunze a, might be the biggest star of the group, but there might. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much depth at wide receiver though, too. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think if I had to, I would probably go Bowers before him. I, I just think that in this offense and with what they already have, I think the tight end just changes everything so much more. So I got this one ranked behind the other ones right now, um, but it's close. Like yeah. I, I think all these things are kind of paired together. And if you have any one of these three scenarios hit, I yeah. think you're kind of happy yeah. These are it. all. We're wasting a lot of breath because these guys, everyone's going to be like, I could, Nick and Mike got me so excited for all these guys, and then they're going to go five, six, seven, eight, nine in I the know. ground. But it could happen. Um, I agree with you. The tiebreaker for me is that I think of these three, a uh, good wide receiver, not a great wide receiver, but a good wide receiver is the easiest thing to find. A second round receiver, a fourth round receiver, and they already have some pretty good receivers on the roster right now there's just th- those two other ones are are more unicorns to me that stud left tackle and certainly that stud tight end so i i have the same thing fashion new bowers odunze right now but now we have somebody i don't know if this is your number one there's two scenarios left dallas turner the alabama defensive end look is arguably the saint's second biggest need uh the pass rush the defensive line um this guy's a total stud uh probably the highest ranked player of any of these guys but i have yet i mean Speaking of groupthink, I have yet to see anyone that has not put him with the Atlanta Falcons with the eighth pick. Um, so if somehow Atlanta goes a different direction, um, does Dallas Turner become your top choice of all these guys? Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. Best defensive player in the draft, no yeah. doubt about it. I, I think he's a guy that the Saints want. I, I think he's – he's look, there's just no way he's – He's just not going to be there. So I think that kind of changes plans and everything. That's why you go and get Chase Young. I mean, there's just no way to address it. And I think the drop-off between him and the next guy is, is pretty pretty significant. There's Leatu Latu. There's Jared Verse. Yeah. Uh, you would take everyone else ahead of Latu and Verse that we've talked about today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For sure. Definitely would take them all before them. Um, I think they're good players. It's just these guys are, are, are bad. There's a couple wide receivers I would take before either one of those guys for sure. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think Dallas Turner's – got a chance to be special in the right system with the right idea. I think DA would find a way to kind of take advantage of everything he can do. It's just they're going to have to probably find a way to block him, so get uh, Olu and stop Dallas Turner with him. I uh, Turner's in my top two on this list, but I, th- I think I still like Fashion the, the best. I, I, I like the idea. I mean, just – If they had tackles, would you put I it think, that way? No, I think it's a tiebreaker for me. I think Fashionu and Turner might have the same grade for me. That's why. Like, I don't think I'm 
settling for the lesser player if I draft Olu Fashionu, but I know I'm filling a bigger, an even bigger need. And defensive end is a huge need, but man, I'm just going to feel so much better about everything Saints related if I'm not as worried about their offensive line. If I and I think Fashionu is a legit. I think every guy we've listed is a legit top ten prospect in this draft. Class. Oh yes, and, for sure. And I'm okay with taking the left tackle who's in my top ten. I don't think I'm I'm like settling if I do that. So. And here's the last one. Here, here, and we've talked about all these needs the Saints have. Howie Roseman wants to move up from 22, and he calls and he says, Mickey, this time I'm going to overpay. I know you've gotten me a few times on the trade value charts. This time I'm going to overpay for that 14th pick. I'm moving up to 22, and I'm giving you 53 in round two. 22 and 53 for that 14th pick. Do you take that over all these scenarios? I'm going to tell Howie he needs to like throw in the seventh. Like they, they got to get like one of those a 2026 20, seventh. Yeah, they got to get one of the picks back. Like one of those throw-ins. Like you got to. And I want my seventh back. Like you know, <laughs> like hit him like draft day. Like you got to give something back there. But it even happens like in the Buffalo. Like there's spare change in that trade. It was just you've, nuts. I've been on this campaign. It's replaced. Get rid of the chains for me. As my why does every trade? What charts are they going up? This is not a mandate. You do not have to trade your 2026 seventh for their 2025 sixth to even these things out. Just like it's stop nuts. The I, I don't madness. I don't understand why they do it. Like who can half those guys are probably sitting there like, damn, we gotta like pick 237. Like we gotta sit here until the Some end. Some people are trying thing. to probably get rid of seventh. I know. No. I, I hope the Saints do it this year. Oh, they got man. a lot of late picks. They do. <laughs> uh but yeah, look, I it's tough for me. It's it's tough for me to 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 go to this. I mean, I I think some of their positions in need. If you move back, you can still get a good player. Like if you want a wide receiver, if you want an offensive tackle, you can get those by moving back. So this is a great draft to move back in if you want to. It's just always it, it's so easy to say to move back yes. and and assume that like they're going to get more picks and you know. But the truth is, is you get a player you believe in more if you kind of pick where you're at. Yep. So. I don't I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is here. It's right if it works. It's wrong if it doesn't. I covered a team for a, a many years that traded back every single draft, yeah. and they drafted terribly. And they didn't hit on those guys. They drafted terribly. Everybody said trade down because Bill Belichick does it, and then you go through, and he didn't hit on them. And you know what? I did this study once uh, on that because I've covered the Saints for a long time, and everybody's do what Bill Belichick does. The one time that he nailed his first round pick was when he traded up for Chandler Jones. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. That's right. Yeah, look, it, it, it's easy to say it, and if you hit on him, it's brilliant, yeah. and if you don't, you don't. I, I think the draft is super inexact, period. I think if you go through and look at anybody's history, like everybody's bad at drafting. Yeah. Nobody's really actually good at it. No philosophy. The only good philosophy is the one that works, and no one knows what's going to work. But, again, if you're trying to play the odds here and pick up just assets and you're saying, okay, there are 10 first round offensive tackles, seven first round offensive tackles. We're taking one of them no matter what. And the guy we can get at 14 isn't going to be that much different than the one yeah. at 22. Then I think you do it. But I think just trading back as a general philosophy right. isn't always Completely the best idea. You need to have like an actual plan of action instead of just saying, we're going to just maximize the assets and, and hope for the best. In some ways, like I get the theory behind it because everybody's wrong about everything, but you have to believe in your scouting at some point. And I don't think the way the Saints have drafted is great, but at least like they believe in yeah. what they're doing to some extent. Um, and I think you have it's tough because they've been bad drafting early on, but you have better odds. Like you have better odds of hitting if you if you really believe in the guy. You're well, taking. I think this what we're doing today is the perfect. Actually, put yourself to the test if you believe in trading down. We're talking about this level of player. Like, yeah, trade down in theory, but what if Fashionu is there? What if? Bowers is there. What if yeah. Odunze is there? What if Dallas Turner falls there? Oh, well, now I don't want to trade down because I love that guy. Well, sometimes the Saints might have their like number six overall graded player on the board at 14. That's when they don't trade down because they love a guy. It doesn't mean they're right, but if your number six overall favorite player in the entire draft is there at 14, you don't trade down. Like Maybe you're wrong to fall in love, but when you do, you don't trade down. I, I do like the idea of trading down in theory, though. I don't know if I like it better than these four guys, but if these four guys are gone, which we expect them to be, it might be my next favorite thing. Overtaking yeah. a J.C. Latham, overtaking a Brian Thomas, receiver from LSU, um, overtaking a Jared Verse. Maybe I can get Tyler Guyton, uh, the offensive tackle at 22 that we both kind of like. Maybe uh, Fautanu uh, from Washington falls there. One of these offensive tackles is probably going to fall further than expected. 
uh, and I can get them at 22 and now have two second-round picks. I've never cared more about second-round picks than I do with this current Saints roster that's kind of aging and has so many holes than I do right now. So these are my top five. I'll say uh, F- Fashionu, Turner. You say Turner, Fashionu, Bowers, Odunze, trade down. But I like them better than all the guys who might really be there at 14. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if you can trade down and get Brian Thomas. Six three four three might not last until the twenties. That's a yeah, it's that's true. a that's a freak. True. That's a freak. But yeah, look, I, I like I like having a reason why. You yeah. know, if you're taking someone, I like to have a reason why. I felt like a lot of times Belichick just had a reason. He didn't have a reason why. It was just <laughs> we're going back and we're going to get somebody. But half the time they were like targeting somebody. It was just someone that made no sense in that position anyhow. So their whole I'll draft process was so sense. weird. To if me. you really want to. "Quote unquote," win the draft. I mean, what did the who, did the Patriots trade down before they took that guard Cole Strange that that surprised everyone? Like, I get that. Like the year the Saints took Peyton Turner, I, I get when people want to see like, look, gamble a little bit. If you really like Peyton Turner, but everyone thinks he's going to go fortieth, trade down to thirty fifth and get him there. Like, I, I understand that, but sometimes it just takes one other team to like the guy too. So. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, just be- it goes back to the very first point, though. Like, you don't know that Peyton Turner is going to be there yeah. at forty, just because all the mocks say yeah. he's going to be there at forty. It doesn't mean. I remember right before that draft, uh, the NFL Network had a report saying like there were the, the, the surprise round. guy, the first round is going to probably be Peyton Turner. Many teams like him. Da da da. Like, I think that he had some. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not defending the pick. I just don't know if that was the guy. If you can always be like trade back and get him, because no, right, a lot right. of times I think. I think people are wrong about how they have these players ranked. And then I, I, I hate how it dictates the conversation, though, because going to the Mayock point, like Mayock's thing, like kind of set the tone, but then he's actually drafted and it didn't work. Yeah. Like, so his. This is one of my favorite points I've ever made. If Jeff Ireland retired from the Saints tomorrow and, and joined NOF as our scouting analyst, Jeff Ireland's big board oh, would God. be gospel. Like, everyone would trust that over Daniel Jeremiah's big board and. and you know, Mel Kuyper's big board and all of them, they would be like Jeff Ireland. Of course he's going to have the best, but because he works for a team, yeah. he's an idiot. That's not what Mel Kuyper said. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, yeah. It's crazy. Uh, draft season. It's here. We're going to be covering all of it. Mock draft tomorrow. Make sure you sign up to the site and check that out. Um, we'll have that up sometime tomorrow, probably in the afternoon. All right. Now it is time for our money segment presented by Jefferson financial federal credit union. The Saints are about $10 million under the salary cap right now. They'll get a very small amount of space back when Mike Thomas and Jameis Winston come off the books on June 2nd. Plenty of money to sign their draft class. It shouldn't be too uh, cost yeah, As it is right anything. now, they only need about $2 million yeah, in space. One of those guys yeah. replaced somebody yeah. that's already on the roster. So, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't cost that much to sign all these guys. But – they could do a couple other things. They could rework Taysom Hill's contract, Alvin Kamara's contract, and do all that stuff to kind of free up a little bit more money. But should they spend it? Should they still add a couple of veterans that may only cost a couple million bucks? Makai Becton, Andrus P, Hunter Renfro, Tyler Boyd, run stuffing nose tackle, or should they stand pat? What are you doing? This is why people don't put me in charge. Like I'm, I'm, I'm just like the Saints. I'm like, gosh, I have the space. Could add Mackay Becton and Tyler Boyd, you know, like why not do it and go try to win 10 games instead of eight this year or whatever. Um, but I kind of want to see them keep showing this discipline. I kind of would love to see them carry over all 10 million and not touch Kamara's contract and not touch Hill's contract for two reasons. Easier for me to say, since I'm not as invested as they are, I kind of want to watch the saints save money this year and then still try to be competitive. Hey, surprise, surprise. We were, Vegas had us at seven and a half and we won 10. Like that'd be a good year. I'd catch up on the cap and make a surprise run with lower expectations. That's what I want to see. If I'm running this team, man, it's hard not to want to add Makai Becton and Tyler Boyd. (laughs) I think they'll probably spend a little bit and I think they should. I mean, I think you have to spend a little bit at at tackle. If there's a vet that you can add and you can just – and it's, it's not like it's a certain point. It's about player safety, too, and just yeah. doing what's best for Derek Carr and making sure he doesn't get hurt and making sure that you can run the ball and you're blocking and nobody's, you know, in peril ever. And I think if you're not going to spend on the backup quarterback, you need to spend on the tackle to make sure that you don't have to get to your backup quarterback. So you should one, write that down. Like, yeah. yeah. One way or another, like, I think you have to spend a little bit, but I don't think any of these guys are going to cost major money. I think you can get any one of them on a similar deal to like what they've been doing with yeah. you know the 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 receiver whoever else like a few million bucks one year deal bring them in let them run out there and take off but i agree with you 
I would love it if they can go in the season and not touch Alvin and not touch Taysom. Because, look, I mean, they can do stuff and they can get rid of them if they don't want, but it's it's just cleaner. It's yeah. cleaner. And if the idea is to have a cleaner cap, like, make cleaner moves. So I, I would like someday to just be able to look at the attached money to somebody and just do the accounting that way instead of, like, well, you can manipulate this, this, and this. And I think that's where they want to exist, too. So if that's the goal, just do it. Like, just try to get there without touching it. And if the clock's winding down on these guys, make it even easier to to walk away or let their contracts, you know, just do what they do and, and negotiate from a different place if you want to extend it. But I, I think it's just better to kind of kind of just let it go to the end and then revisit it at that point. And I want to see them do that more often. Yeah, it feels like at this point, they'll probably wait till after the draft see what they didn't get and maybe if they just add one more guy that'd be a nice compromise like maybe if they get another pass catcher they don't have to mess around with hunter renfro tyler boyd anyone of that level um if they double dip on offensive tackles maybe they don't sign but maybe sign the one guy you don't one spot you don't fill we know you can look this up on all yap while you look it up do we know exactly what they get for for alvin or or mike and yeah it, it comes out to about one total million dollar they okay. save 1.2 on each of them the, the minimum salary that they agreed to will go off the books, None. but then it gets replaced by a guy who's making like seven fifty. So it comes out to about $1 million they'll save, and then draft picks will cost about $2 million unless they trade down and add another second or third or fourth rounder. So there'll be about $9 million under the cap if they don't do anything else. Yeah, I need to go back and look and see what they typically have as like their, their operating balance for During the, the season. season. Yeah, because yeah. they do need an operating balance. Yeah, because people are going to get hurt. You're going to sign people, stuff Sometimes like that. you cut some guys that make some money too, and that adds to it too. Yeah, so. if they could go in, yeah. I mean, if you can sign a few of these guys and, and have five, six, seven million dollars in, in, I don't know, yeah. in, case, in case of emergency, break the glass on something – they might have to do one just to create enough room so you're not like in a weird situation in the season. If they and, trade Marshawn Lattimore, then they have to maximize everything. But just to fit him, this it, look, Stephon Diggs in, trade was interesting because it's 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 almost identical to Marshawn Lattimore's. They just got to eat it. Um, now it'll be off the books for the future, but they got to find a way to eat it in the short term. I was surprised they took that. Would they say 31, 31 million? million? I'm surprised they took it all this season, but good for them that they, they could had afford to. to do they it. They had to. I mean, they, unless they could have waited until because uh, it's a future. But then the pick. other team doesn't get they, the, the other team doesn't get him draft. until June yeah. 2nd. Yeah. yeah, you can't you can't fake the June. You can't do the this is a pseudo June first. You got to really the guy can't show up in Houston until June. 2nd. There were draft picks in this draft. Yes. Yeah. So they had to do yes. it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of interesting. I thought the compensation is probably comparable. Like if you could get a second for Marshawn, even if it's a year from now, and then it allowed you to do the June second. Like I could see that yeah. working for them. But you know, if you're doing it now, I think you got to pay yeah. a little more. I don't know. It, but yeah. they always say like a pick a year from now is kind of like it's like a three now is that, is a two next that was, year. I mean, when you added all that up, it was barely the equivalent of a third round pick. It was surprisingly low for me. I I think that'd be a hard sell for Marshawn Lattimore. I think people would want more. Vocal, vocally disgruntled player, yeah. I think, is one thing. Yeah. I think it's going to be interesting to see um, how he does in, in that situation. But, yeah, I mean, that's one of those trades you see it, and you're like, that, that's it? And yeah. then, like, you kind of start thinking about it. It's like, all right, it kind of makes it. some sense. There's yeah, usually but. a big salary attach, only so many years left. I, I, I get it when that happens, but... But to eat $31 million for a team that was a game away from the Super Bowl, like, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that I know what the Bills are doing right now, but if it was that bad, he had to get out of there makes sense sometimes things are uh, happening that we don't see and that's one of them but I don't think the Marshawn situation has ever gotten that bad to where they have to move them and everybody's like well they have to move them like I don't I don't think it's there it's no. just it's it's not that would so, be the best case yeah, scenario for yeah. the Saints if they don't have to they don't have to and I don't think they do have to but we will uh certainly talk more about that in future episodes but right now we're going to get back to um the show right after this short commercial break so check out this uh Quick message from our sponsors, and we will be right back. Are you tired of renting and ready to own your dream home? Contact Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union, your trusted source for home loans. Our competitive rates and flexible terms can help make your home ownership dreams a reality. If you're a first-time home buyer or looking to refinance, our experienced lenders are here to help. Our online application process allows you to apply on your schedule. It's quick, easy, and convenient. Visit us online at jeffersonfinancial.org to learn more. Federally insured by NCUA, Equal Housing Lender. Martin Wine and Spirits is home to a selection of hand-picked barrel select bourbon, whiskeys, and much, much more. They are family owned and operated since 1946 and specialize in wine, spirits, gourmet food, gift baskets, catering, and tasting events. They have many locations, so they're never too far away. You can check them out in Metairie, New Orleans, Mandeville, and Baton Rouge, 
Or if it's more convenient, you can always shop online. Whether you're a wine novice or a seasoned collector, you'll enjoy the Martin Wine and Spirit experience. Welcome back to our studio on Veterans Memorial Boulevard. It's now time for the Hard Hide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey segment. And uh, I wanted to ask you about this. You had an interesting nugget in your last rundown on the website where you talked about Chris Olave focusing on getting stronger uh, this year. And I guess maybe there's a no-duh element to that. It was the huge focus for him last year, and I, and I thought we saw some of the results from it. Um, but it's funny that it's something we're not talking about this year, and it makes me think, you know, how much further do you think he has to go? And, and for that matter, you went uh, and spoke to Rashid Shahid uh, about two weeks ago about what he's working on this offseason, and let's throw A.T. Perry in there too. These are the guys we feel best about. This is the position group we might feel best about on the Saints roster. But what specific steps do you want to see those three guys take this offseason? Yeah, I think for Chris, he, he made enough progress on it to make it not a concern, but I don't think it became a strength. But he, he sure. did make some contested catches last year. It wasn't something that was like an epidemic anymore. I think his first year, there were signs of it, and then it quickly went away, and it became a huge issue for him. But I thought last year he made a handful of those plays, so it took the edge off it. But I think it's something just that, that he wants to make a strength of his game, that he wants to be able to go up and kind of you know attack things a little bit, kind of be able to win those 50-50 balls and, and be a go-to guy in those situations. and. Just getting a little bit stronger, I think, would help him with that. And, um, yeah, that's that's what he's kind of working on right now. Shahid was kind of – he didn't really open the door too much on kind of what he's looking to do. It was just kind of like, you know, enjoying some downtime right now, getting better at everything. So I think that he's just going to keep trying to to build on everything he's doing. For AT, I think it's just consistency, more reps. I, I, I really like the stuff we saw from him last year. And when he came on, he, he – he just kind of he took off kind of quickly, but I think it's just building on everything. But his starting point was so good, and that's not even just looking at it as a six round pick. I think just in general, he came out and quickly showed that that he could be good at everything. And I think it's just getting you know more timing down with the the quarterback. I would be interested to know what they're doing if they're having an off season camp or something. You know, typically that's something that you yeah, kind of see. Carr brought with him these to Vegas last year, I think, after the last OTAs during that dead dead time. I I'd like be to surprised see, if he does that again. Yeah, like I, like you know, Brady used to have like the Montana camp where they kind of like spent like the whole off season. Like I, I would like to see or hear something about that. So it would be good if they're doing that. But I think it's just getting that timing down, and, and with him just kind of being more comfortable with everything he's doing. I was surprised at just kind of how quickly he picked everything up last year, though. Like he he felt like. You know, someone that, that was confident kind of really quickly. It and, feels like he belongs in that group. That, yeah. I mean, it's how he carries himself. It doesn't necessarily, you know, a, a lot of people have, have more confidence than they deserve to have. But he just, he felt like he was part of that young trio. And it was funny. I even am picturing, I'm picturing how well they all played together in the last home game uh, where they all had their highlights. They had their choreographed dance. Like we, we were interviewing A.T. Perry afterwards and somebody said, oh, how, how, do you, how have you three gotten along? He goes, did you see that dance? We put? You know, he was like. He goes, that, there you go. That, that's us. You know, we know they spend time together uh, off the field, too. Uh, and I, I don't think it should be understated. I mean, look, um, Chris Olave got a lot of heat last year for when him and Derek Carr were not on the same page. We talked about it a lot. I think it was even a bigger problem for Rashid Shaheed. There was a lot of times yeah. that Houston lost where Rashid Shaheed was just not doing. There was an a interception. I can't remember if it was a pick six, but a, a really costly interception in, in a home loss. Was that the Jaguars game or um, where, where Rashid Shaheed didn't quite finish the route the way Carr expected him to? I don't think it should be understated how well all those guys started to get on the same page in December. Carr's numbers went up. Carr's efficiencies went up. The interceptions went down. The receiver's numbers went up. And I, and I think they're really hitting the ground running in year two. It kind of stinks that there's so much just negativity engulfing everything because, like, these three guys, like, there is a lot to be excited about what they could do and where they could go. And you, you just mentioned at the end of the season, things really did turn, and it really did look different. And you can parse out however you want, opponents, whatever. Like, it, it was different. It was better. It, there was a lot there. It looked like it was building towards something. It's unfortunate that just kind of the way – that the whole season went as a whole and just kind of the reaction to it and just kind of the conversations like it's hard to see this thing that was really good and something that, that really should be a source of excitement. Like if you're looking for things to be excited about a team building, there's three really young receivers yeah. here that are really, really good and they are building blocks to this team, but it just kind of gets lost behind like all the, you know, just, it's just, it's just, yeah. there's not a lot of light coming through the clouds right now. And, it, and it's too bad because these guys should be talked about in a way and that should be kind of the thing that's leading the coverage. How do they build around them? How do they get better for them? But 
you know, the season went out, went, it was a disappointing nine wins. Now you don't have any tackles. It's just kind of hard to look at this when there's so much going on, but it really is something that, that I think that we should probably talk about more. And I think people in general should be significantly more excited about it. Um, all right. Our next segment is brought to you by Jouet Productions. Make sure you check them out. If you want to record a podcast, get your sound right, get your visuals right. They'll get you right. They make everything look better. Make sure you check them out. That's uh, J-O-U-E-R dot productions on the internet. Send them an email. They'll get you right. All right. Let's, uh, we've covered a lot of drafts. We're getting old. It's been about 30 Saints drafts combined between us. The heavier side of that is on, is on you than me. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, we, we've worked as, as rivals. We've worked together now. Um, what is the draft choice that stands out to you the most that you nailed? Like you're looking at the draft. You projected it. You wrote it, you said it, you felt great about it. What's the one that when you look back, you're like, you're like, damn, I, I was on it that year. I took I took this question slightly different, but the answer is still the same. It was the one that when they made it, I I I was like, they like I thought they nailed it. Um, but I I, I probably because, because I picked it, it was uh Brandon Cooks in 2014. I was at ESPN at the time, and they had all of us reporters get together for a mock draft, and I traded up. From 27 to 19, I found a, a reporter, uh, the Dolphins I traded with. I traded up for that mock draft, made a big spectacle of it. We had to tell the editors we made a trade and everything like that. Saints traded up from 27 to 20 to get Brandon Cooks. I was so close, but I, I'm taking full credit for that. But, man, I never – there's not a pick. There were some years where I think we all knew what they were going to do. Uh, um, Cedric Ellis in, in 2008, Malcolm Jenkins in 2009 – um, Reggie Bush in 2006. There were, there were a lot of years. Sheldon Rankins was another one that I feel like everyone knew this is their big hole. This is what they're going to do. Brandon Cooks is the one that absolutely, I was like, how can this guy not catch? I thought he was going to catch a lot of short passes from Drew Brees, do stuff after the catch. I remember doing a story that summer about how I thought he was going to win the NFL's Offensive Rookie of the Year. I thought 100 catches was possible. I thought he would just be this mega slot. Um, he got there a little bit, but even with all the good things he did for the Saints and then eventually got traded for a first-rounder, still going with a great career, I even expected more from him. But uh, but there is not a pick. When I look back all the way, this will be my 20, 20th Saints draft, there's not a pick that I felt better about that they had nailed more than Brandon Cooks. Hold up. We're going to have the Cooks conversation real quick. We're gonna have the Reggie Cooks conversation. But, I mean, Reggie Bush would have been an obvious answer. We're gonna, I thought, we're gonna I thought the... he was going to do better, too. But... Oh, hold on. That... I, I don't think Brandon Cooks has had a disappointing career. I think he's not a, a disappointment, but I mean, I thought they had just drafted the next like, like Stephon Diggs or something. I don't. I I remember comparing him to Percy Harvin at the time. I thought they were going to use him in a way where it was going to be tons of catches, tons of yak, and he ended up being a little bit more like seventy catches for eleven hundred yards. They were throwing deep to him a lot at the same time of Drew Brees' career, where people were wondering about his deep arm strength. I, I almost thought. I expect him to be used differently more than I think he disappointed anyone. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that surprised me the most about Cooks it, when he was here, he he was just so like rigid in the way he did that. It was so mechanical, like it was just so mechanical. Like if you wanted him to he go did nothing after, if the you catch. wanted him to go from yeah X Y to Z, like he was going to X Y to Z exactly as it was drawn up on the page. But like there was no you know art to it, and they tried to use him on some of that stuff, and it was just like. It was shocking to me because you go back and watch his college tapes and there there was some creativity in, in some of the stuff he did, but he would get the ball on like a, a jet sweep and it was just like so just he, he kind of ran like it was like light Taysom. You know what I mean? Like it was just kind of like he, he was just kind of going and like yeah. Taysom, the Taysom's kind of the same way. Like he's, he's going to go and take off and there's not a whole lot of like jiggle to it. Like I was shocked by that, but. I think I think Cooks has had a good career though. Oh, no uh, question. Yeah, no question. he he definitely has. I mean, there's been one, two, three, four, five, six thousand yard seasons. Like he he's had some staying power too. Uh, I don't know how many times people get traded for first round picks, but he's probably leads the league in that right now too. So it's kind of wild to, to see it. Yeah, like even that. Jalen yeah. Ramsey didn't get traded for a first the second time. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he <laughs> didn't. Brandon Cooks said that's that's actually kind of that's actually kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, for me, I think the one that they nailed the most, and I, I think I, I nailed it the most as well. Um, the Mike Thomas pick, like that was one I, I took him in the first round. One of our, I love it. I took him in the first round on one of our mock drafts. Um, I t was tweeting that they should take him. I think they picked 12 that year. I was tweeting that they should take him at 12. Like speaking of Sheldon Rankins, that was a Sheldon Rankins year. Yeah. Like just watching him. It, it was just, I don't know. It was so obvious to me that, that he was going to be great. Like if you, you looked at the numbers and the numbers weren't great, it was like 600 yards or whatever. And then like you watch and it, 
just the way they were using him. He looked like he was misused at Ohio State. I, I never believed in anyone that I've watched like more than than that. And that was the guy that I, I was just like, man, they got to get him. Um, I had no intel that they were going to draft him. I, I just felt so strongly about it that I ended up watching his whole entire college career that offseason. This is my second draft, first draft covering the Saints. Like, I didn't have any sources or anything at the time. And I was just like, this is the guy. Like, they have to draft him, and I'm going to be ready if they do. I ra- I'd like the story written up. Like, they they took him. That didn't go to waste. I, I just always, I don't know. He, he was just the one guy I watched. And I was like, everybody was on Treadwell. I was like, there is no way. Like, Treadwell is not the guy. Like, it has to be Mike Thomas. And they got Mike in the second round. And I, I think that's probably one of the best picks. You can say what you want about the second contract. The, the, the pick itself, I think, is one of the best picks I ever made. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. no question. Little known story. The Saints liked that article so much that they've just started, you know, like uh, nah. <laughs> asking you to make their picks for them ever since. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was definitely that was definitely uh, one there. I mean, th- there's been a few. There's been a few that I think they've absolutely nailed. I think I mean, it didn't last long, but I think the value they got out of like it's weird to say this, but I think the value they got out of CJ Gardner Johnson's one that that was fourth round like oh yeah. and he you picks got multiple years nailed, out of him is a long list picks they've nailed but i'm just talking about the ones that right in the moment we were like oh they nailed that one. Oh like, yeah even alvin Kamara. i think we i think we both loved the alvin Kamara pick at the time and thought he's going to be really fun in this offense but we didn't know for sure um yeah i was writing the whole offseason that they desperately needed the the satellite back like yeah, they needed yeah. it to open up their offense and he, 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 man he was so much more than that but it was, he was more that than too. we thought yeah. but yeah that yeah. was that's one that stands out as a well this is a, a perfect fit i mean if we were doing this with free agents our answer would both be cj spiller and we would have got that one oh, wrong God. yeah <laughs> same idea wrong guy they just got it right <laughs> yeah. a year later with yeah, with, exactly. with alvin um I thought they nailed the Marshawn pick until yeah, we found course. out what they of missed course, on. <laughs> of course. I mean, Marshawn is probably the one that analysts, fans, everything we're most excited about because back to what we talked about at the top of the show, everyone had Marshawn in their top five that year, and the Saints got him at 11. It was like uh, that never happens. Like, the, the, like even the Saints said all their own internal mock drafts had him going by five or six at the latest. They didn't expect that to even be a conversation in their room. So that was the, I can't believe the guy was there at 11 guy and he's had an incredible career and it was the worst pick they've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to our Martin's question of the day. Martin's is home to a hand picked select bourbon whiskeys and so much more Martin's so much more than just wine. This question is from Marlon. How many years away are the saints from being able to theoretically facilitate a trade for a top QB prospect? Like Minnesota seems to be doing where the team can be able to support the QB with the pieces it already has in place. I, I love this question because it really makes me think, when is the right time to do it? We, ju- we just talked about And just to be clear, if there's anyone listening who thinks we think Marshawn is a bad pick for any other reason, it was because that was the year that they were strongly considering Patrick Mahomes. They should have just traded up for Mahomes instead because he's maybe Best player one of, of the greatest time. player of all time. Um, uh, otherwise, Marshawn is a great pick. But... Even that year, the Saints were a little torn. Like, Drew Brees still had good years left in him. Is it too early to take a quarterback? Is that not the right year? Is it not the right year when you have the 15th pick and you have to trade up to fourth? The San Francisco 49ers tried that with with Trey Lance. Um, Is it only the right year when you hit rock bottom? Um, We saw it work a couple times, I guess, when the Rams traded up for Jared Goff when they were already a ready team. Like, when is it when is it the right time? Does it does it all have to fall apart? Do you have to have no answer at quarterback? Or should you be like the Detroit Lions right now and they're like, we have a, a you know, a dynasty on our hands, possibly if we get our hands on Drake Mage. Like I, I don't know. It never feels like the right time. You have to blow everything up to take a quarterback because now you can't get your left tackle and you can't get your defensive end. I I I, I think it could be this year. Why not? Like, I mean, if 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 they wanted to it's hard to do it from the 14th pick. They don't have any ammo. I don't even know if there's a team who would take their call right now. What could they even offer? But I think for the Saints, the time is now or next year or the year after. We're in that time now. For me, it's not even necessarily a, a roster question. I, I think if you if you make that move up for the, the rookie quarterback, the thing that I would want to see to be in place, and again, you can manipulate it however you want, but I, I would want them to be able to manipulate it to the full extent to not cover up bad bad debt like I would just want the cap to be cleaner so that 
if you do draft CJ Stroud, you can go all in around them and you can maximize like the Texans every, are doing right you now. You can maximize every single dollar and you build the the team around the rookie quarter, the rookie contract, and, and you can take full advantage of that. But if you do it now, you have bad money on the books. You're trying to cover up for things. And if you do start stretching those dollars, I want you stretching from zero so you're getting max value out of them instead of like, all right, we're getting back even to what it should be. So that would be the only thing for me because if, if they traded for him now, it would be like two years from now before they got in that situation where they're kind of on the other side of some of this stuff and you're, you're wasting time at that point. So, yeah. I, But in general, I think the best time to do it is when the opportunity presents itself because if you're waiting for the moment, like, you know, as, you, as you're waiting and planning your future, life is happening and you you just bypass things kind of waiting for this perfect moment. And I just don't think that's that's how it works. I think when opportunity is there, I don't care who's on your team, what roster you have. If you're the the Patriots and you're picking third in the draft and Jaden Daniels is there and that's who you want, you don't say, well, damn it, we don't have the roster for him, so we're going to bypass here's, this. Here's what's interesting because about Because you might not be back though. there. I, I think it's about the guy more than it's about the moment. I mean, Mahomes' example is the ultimate example. They, they should have done sure. it because they believed in that guy. You might go six years before you find a guy that you like that much, and that guy might be going first. But what is interesting is how we just talk about teams differently. We are watching all these reports of Minnesota and Denver being the two teams most likely to trade up for J.J. McCarthy. And we're dismissing that as even a possibility for the Saints because J.J. McCarthy just doesn't feel like the guy right. that's worth it to me. Like, So what makes Minnesota and Denver teams that it's worth it for them and the Saints a team that it's not worth it for them, just that they already have so much invested in the position? You have to have the vacancy to 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 – to trade up for a McCarthy level quarterback, I guess. Yeah, see, like that isn't a move that I would want to make. Like yeah. it's just not something that. So go ahead and do it. Like I'm yeah. not jealous of that. I'm not jealous yeah. of a team that can that can go get JJ McCarthy and maybe he ends up being great. But like I'm not convinced by it. But if you're going to go for it, I guess the point. I'm I, my only thing here is that I just think when you can do it, you do it, and if it's yeah. for the right guy, you do it. Like that. That's got to be about I, the guy. Yeah, I don't think you just go do it to do it, and it's just yeah. like we're going to go all in on JJ McCarthy yeah. because we can get from twelve to seven. Okay, but like, is he the right guy? Yep. That that's what it has to be. Like, the 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 problem for me with like the Mahomes example is that they believe them and then go get them. Like, that's that's the yep. issue. So, yep. if you can go get them, go get them, and it's the right guy, do it. But yeah, I mean, I I don't think you wait for the perfect like our rosters in the perfect place. Now we can go get the quarterback. It has to be like we love the quarterback and the opportunities there. So go do it. If like, they, there's a lot if of they loved a Mahomes level player this year, they would go get him this year. I do not think they're ruling. You know, I think the circumstances make me predict they're not going to get a quarterback this year because I think the three, almost two, but three most surefire guys are going to go one, two, and three. And I doubt that they love someone else as much as they love Mahomes. But if they had a Mahomes-level grade on Nix or Penix or McCarthy, I, now is the time. Yeah. If you have that level grade on a guy. It's, it's like just like a lot like life. Like You can't. I'm going to get the perfect job and the perfect house and the perfect yeah. marriage and the perfect retirement plan and the perfect, like it just doesn't work out like that. Like at some point you have to see the right opportunity in the right player and you have to be willing to say F it. And yeah. it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be the perfect time because look, if you're close enough to, to move up to get someone like you have flaws, like it's just never going to be Houston. Wasn't in a perfect situation to have CJ Stroud. Like they, they yeah. got them. They figured out their offensive line was not good last year. And yep. They found a way to make it work. They got better. They went out and they got better players, and they're going for it. So it's just if you can get the quarterback, you get the quarterback because it's just so hard to get the quarterback. Yep. So that's just kind of the way it it, it should work out. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we're if we're talking about ideal situations. Oh, I don't think the Saints are, are in one. But if the right guys are to present, yeah, if they got go to pick it. their moment, yeah. they would play out Derek Carr's contract, and the very next year they would do this. And that nothing would cap. help the yeah. cap more than finally having a. Ro- I mean. Everyone talks about the Saints' cap issues, but one of the things is they have been paying at least $20 million for a quarterback for most of the last 15 years. And um, these teams that – rookie quarterbacks are a cheat code in more ways than one. They absolutely are. All right, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks for checking out the show. If you aren't signed up to the website yet, make sure you do that. Use the code NOF to save 20% on your first payment. Our mock draft is going up tomorrow on Thursday afternoon. Make sure you check that out. And until next time, we'll see you then.